This is an exciting course for me. This course, this content, is the reason I moved to California. Characters in games, movies, short films, commercials, children's books, illustration, whatever it might be, any kind of character, creature, four legs, two legs, ten legs, four arms, ten arms, doesn't matter. Uh, this is the sort of thing that really gets me excited, and I'm glad to finally get to this point where I'm recording this course. I've taught this course several times at the beginning of my career. I used to teach it every semester, and then as the courses got more and more speci specific, uh, this class eventually was only available once every three semesters, and then it became once every four semesters. And so now we're actually to that point where it's only available once every two years. And that's just the way things are at the public education. But now I'm going to be recording this in this format, and it's going to be available to you at any time. So this is going to be very exciting. Let's get started and take a look at this uh, artwork I have right here on the screen. So the piece on the left-hand side is by... Marcin Zeibel, and it's designed by Jonathan Camacho. So in the classroom, uh, this is from uh, spring 2012, in the classroom, I don't allow an artist to model their own designs. Uh, they have to make another artist's designs. Uh, this is to force them into a situation where they have to collaborate with another artist and uh, basically get instructions on how the design is supposed to uh, unfold, if you will, into 3D. The one in the middle is modeled by Jonathan Camacho, designed by Marcin, so they were just buddies sitting next to each other in the classroom. Um, the one in the middle uh, by John was uh, started in ZBrush. He prefers to work in ZBrush, and then he brought it in, retopologized it in Maya, and then he passed those skills on to Marcin as well. The one on the right-hand side is designed by a former student, Lauren Bennett, and it is modeled by me. That was my in-class example. And uh, that was completely modeled inside of Maya. Uh, no ZBrush work uh, involved in that one. So let's get started. So again, welcome to 3D Character Modeling with me, Matthew. And to find out more about me and my previous students' work, please visit my website. That's formandspace.com. Or visit the Vimeo page where I have showcased many, many student works over the, over the years, uh, going all the way back to 2005. And that's at my Vimeo Dot com slash store. So before we begin the modeling process, actually getting in there and moving vertices around, we've got some stuff to talk about, some process discussion, and to find some terms. So the processes that I want to discuss are the various approaches to 3D computer modeling that can be summed up into the two following processes, and both of which will be demonstrated throughout the course of this training. So there's the traditional method. The method I'm referring to is polygon modeling, not surface modeling. So I'm not going all the way back to early 90s. I'm more like uh, late 90s, early 2000. When polygon modeling had several names, and the most famous name is box modeling, and then lesser known and less used is point to point, or the name that I like to use is called construction modeling. So construction modeling to me is where you just rip apart the model. I actually cover this quite a bit in the Introduction to 3D Modeling coursework. The primary tool for box modeling is extrusions and insertions of edge loops. Polygon modeling is very useful to better control edge flow and deformation control. Unlike surface modeling, it gives the artist the freedom to add and remove polygons as they see fit. So this is the real advantage to it versus the previous surface modeling. UV mapping and painting is superior to surface modeling, yet requires a lot of third-party software intervention. Until maybe more recently, but still a lot of people like to have a third-party software involved. Although faster than surface modeling compared to contemporary methods, it can feel slow and frustrating. It is a dance between the image reference and topology flow, and this method is going to be created in Autodesk Maya. Next is the contemporary method. So contemporary meaning anything that's happening right now. So this is the preferred method of most game and film artists today. The contemporary method is a high to low polygon modeling. The object is sculpted without regard to the flow of the topology. This process allows the artist to focus entirely on the sculpt. This process has variations and exact steps vary from artist to artist and model to model. 
After the sculpt and paint are complete, the model is then retopologized to support good deformation. The high detail information is then transferred to the lower polygon model using image maps. This method, fast to concept with, but can leave a lot of topology issues. So, the retopologizing step requires a good understanding of the traditional method. This method is utilized in Pixelogic's ZBrush. And the screenshot you see here is the work of student John Camacho. And he sketched out the character in ZBrush first, without even thinking about how the character will deform. And more about flow of topology and deformation soon. So I mentioned topology flow and the definitions of both the traditional method and the contemporary method. So let's talk about what, what that is. Topology flow is the map of edges defining the contours of objects. Generally, this is referred to as the flow of the mesh, or also known as edge flow or poly flow. And more liter literal from Google search of the definition, it is the study of geometric properties and spatial relations unaffected by the continuous change of shape or size of figures. And uh, the way in which constituent parts are interrelated or arranged. So this is the way all of the vertices are related to each other and the flow of one to the next defines the contours of this object. And here we're looking at the what's known as the wireframe of the character so that we can see a map of the topology for this character. And this map is critical in defining deformations which is coming up next. So I've mentioned the word deformation a couple of times now, so let's define this. Deformation is the change in topology from the static or base topology over time. Or more literally, from the definition found on Google, the action or process of changing in shape or distorting, especially through the application of pressure. So this definition suits us very well. The application of pressure would be when we create what are called corrective blend shapes, or even more simple, uh, control over the envelope of the mesh in good topology allows for clean deformation of these joints, particularly in the shoulder of a humanoid character. It's a very complex joint. Uh, the hip complex, which is a little less so, and probably the easiest joints in a humanoid character would be elbows, knees, and digits. Those are the easiest ones. And the, uh, and the heel, not as easy, but less easy, than, more easy than the shoulder. And of course, the face being the most complex, we have to go in there and sculpt individual shapes in order to express the character. And as I mentioned earlier, the wireframe of the character is the easiest way to visualize the topology, and that is by viewing the wireframe of the mesh. And I'll go over how to do that and how to render the wireframe of the mesh when the time comes. And since we're still on the topic of topology, I wanted to bring this one forward about subdivision surfaces. So this is a critical point, and it's something to discuss when we're using the traditional methods. So in Maya, there's a way in which we can just grab a cube. We can grab a cube, this one here, and hit number three on the keyboard, and it will turn the cube into this ball. So something important to understand is that that's the subdivision surface proxy, specifically for the render engine mental ray. Okay, that's less important. What's more important is this. The subdivision surface contour and wireframe shouldn't be mistaken as the topology of the mesh. Okay, because the actual topology of the mesh is this one. This is what I call the raw polygons. I call it the raw polygons. It's just when you're in basic face mode. This is the same as hitting number one on your keyboard in Maya. So the proxy gives you basically a preview of what it might look like with subdivision surfaces and the smoothing of the surface. But it's not the actual topology or the actual contours uh, that other processes in Maya refer to, such as fur, hair, texturing, 
uh, envelopes, deformation, all of those other processes refer to the raw uh, polygons of the model. So in order to capture uh, and take advantage of, of this, in Autodesk Maya, we can take full advantage of subdivision surface preview to speed up our modeling process. And I'll discuss this all much more later on. The basic idea with this, though, just to give you a summary of it, is that with this one, I have subds with supporting edges. And what this allows me to do is approximate this shape and then do a, a process called smoothing, which will convert it back to raw polygons, but still have this shape. And that's what we're really looking for. We want the raw polygons to be as close to our concepts, our references, as possible. And then we can use subdivision services as, a, as an icing on the cake, if we even need to. There might be high enough poly count that we don't need to use subdivision surfaces. But we can use subdivision surfaces as a low poly set, so we can create low poly objects like this, like this vase here, this crude drawing I'm doing, and we can do very, very minimal edge loop work on this and then convert that to a high resolution model, and then that's going to be the actual paintable model. And there's many reasons for this. I discussed these in the Introduction to Modeling course, uh, but it becomes even more important now that we're getting into characters that are actually going to deform. Much more on this as we model. So I really just want to deliver this home one more time. This is very important. Topology is critical to all aspects of the 3D process. Deformations of the shoulders, blend targets of the face, clean UV layouts, and adding effects such as fur, hair, and cloth are all dependent on the topology flow. To know the topology flow is to know the character's role and the final output of the project. For short film, you may require more polygons, tighter close-ups of the camera, whereas a mobile game may only require a distant camera, and deformation requirements may not be nearly as demanding. Regardless of whether the model is a low poly for games or high poly for cinema, the flow of the topology defines the quality of deformation, surface textures, and effects. And here's a good screenshot of John Camacho's character unwrapped with a checker pattern over it to check for distortions. And those, that checker pattern would be uh, more distorted had he not had close attention to the flow of the topology of his character. Okay, so let's just look at this character to get some sense of topology flow, uh, a general look at it before we actually dig in and start making a character. So I'll just look at this one half of the character. And let's focus in on the face. Okay, so one thing that you'll note right off the bat is how each polygon is very square like I don't have a lot of rectangular shaped polygons so some of course all they're all rectangular at some level at some point they're not square but I try to keep them as close to square as possible I do try my best to avoid these long rectangular shapes so I actually anticipate in this area right here these these polygons that there'll be some stretching of the texture that will occur and I need to be prepared for that in that I might need to add divisions vertically here in order to make these less long. So cut them in half so they're more square-like. And I need to think about those things as I'm creating this character. I might not have any problem there. Uh, it might not be noticeable at all. It all depends on how much detail is in that area. Um, let's look at things like the shoulder. So I spent quite a bit of time studying shoulders over my years of doing this and teaching this stuff um, I've solved a lot of shoulder deformation issues and I feel, feel that this method that I have defined for this character is a, a very strong shoulder and I can clearly identify uh, clear and uh, descript uh, poly loops that flow around the character in a very specific way like this one right here, which goes from the scapula around the deltoid and over to the sternum. 
just above the breast. And this would be just a little bit different for our male character because we're definitely trying to get some of these fatty tissues in here for the breast. But the underarm pit, the bicep, deltoid, scapula, shoulder, and ex with the exceptions of contours, is going to be very similar to uh, both for both male and female. Let's take a look at the hands. So in this particular character, I came across a method that I thought was incredibly unique. Um, I had never done myself before, and uh, so I, I feel that it's going to yield some pretty darn good results. And that's where I was able to control the flow by making sure that each digit stayed within the range of the hand itself. And, and notice that that geometry doesn't flow past the wrist. So I'm not doing any of that crappy garbage of uh, doing a high to low transition, transition on the wrist. The wrist is really clean. And this is something that's been very important to me over the years, and I finally figured out the best way to do it. And another thing that's really important in helping the flow and, of course, laying down textures for this is making sure that the individual, the individual polygon flows don't uh, run right next to each other. Notice that this one and that one aren't on the same edge loop crosswise. They're actually offset by about two polygons. And I did that for index, middle, here, and then finally for the pinky. And that prevents any of the six edge points from forming when you offset your extrusions. Very critical little piece. And also notice just the high density of poly count on the hand, with the exception of perhaps right here on the uh, the base of the digit, which uh, I'm sure I just overlook at the time overlooked at the time. So definitely good for and ready for deformation. And then so on and so on and so on over the course of the body. Same thing for the toes. Take a close look at that. I was able to force the digits to keep all of that information localized right there underneath the toe. Very nice. I've had models, many models, all of my models in the past before this character where the geometry would run either up the leg or I'd have to transition off in a triangle and those triangles ultimately cause problems with the textures and deformations. And then unique things like getting the horns, the earrings, uh, the hair. Uh, the hair in this case is just intersecting. I fully expected that to be a mixture between painted hair, simulated hair, and polygon hair. So, and also notice that the, the character is modeled with its eyes closed, so that way when we paint the textures, when we open the lid, it compresses the texture as opposed to if we painted the uh, and unwrapped it with the eye open and we close the lid, the texture would stretch. So it's important to paint with the eyelids closed, which is why really good modelers paint with the eyelids closed. And then attaching these unique and absurd ears to the side of the head was a challenge. Let me hide the hair for you. So I'm managing everything by layers over here. So I'll just hide the polygon hair. And we'll frame up a chunk of the ear. Uh, so really it was tough to get and keep uh, the amount of detail that needed to be in the ear in the ear and not span and spread all across the head uh, and down the neck. So I did several transitions that I normally don't want to do, but I thought it would be okay because the ear doesn't deform nearly as much. I have a triangle here and here and here to help with compressing the amount of detail uh, uh, down and, and of course splitting out that detail so that uh, I can define the back of the ear cl uh, clearly. And of course getting enough detail in here to pierce the hole through. There is, there is actually a hole there if I hide the earrings, there is actually a hole penetrating through the ear. And if I turn on subdivision surfaces, you can see that that rounds out nicely. So I completely anticipated that to be subdivision surfaces, but at the same time, I never really anticipated those earrings to not be visible. They're always going to be there. So it didn't really matter to me if that hole was a little bit squarish. So you'll learn to uh, figure out what you can hide and show and uh, things that really need your attention and then other things that can kind of get tucked under the rug. Uh, but in most cases I try to push you to have a complete and thorough attention to detail throughout the entire character and keeping true to the references uh, all the way through. 
Uh, and clearly this female character is a muscular female character. She's supposed to be a very powerful demon lady with some kind of demon powers. So you can see she's quite strong in the shoulders and arms and legs. Uh, something about the cloth. The topology for this one's very different. So this topology was created using uh, surfaces and curves, and then I basically patched it together, defining a high-resolution mesh for it. And the reason for that was so that I could lay down and simulate this cloth against the body, so it would actually react against the body. So the purpose of this high detail is to solve that simulation problem. Uh, without this high amount of detail, it would be uh, very inaccurate collisions with the body. The other advantage to having high polygon detail is at any point I can reduce it. So if I decide that my, my computer is just clunking along and it's just too slow, at any time, at any point, I can go through a process of reducing the geometry, which is really quite easy uh, to do in Maya. So what's critical about this character in, the, in terms of what we're going to be learning is that this character was created following another artist's designs. So this isn't just some basic reference uh, of just looking at some anatomy chunks and trying to put things together. I'm actually staying true to the contours of this design. Throughout the process of creating this, I had to kind of bounce back and forth between, uh, you know, what's literally happening on this edge. Do I follow the inside of the line? Do I follow the outside of the line? I decided to follow the middle of these contour lines and then, of course, make my best visual guess based on actual anatomy reference. So there isn't a lot of detail in the hands of this drawings. She gave me a very rough drawing of that, uh, but I was trying to reach some level of realism that the face established, and then I just kept that throughout the remainder of the body. So there is some margin of interpretation, and my artist tend to, tended to fall off. I actually didn't hear from her after a couple of weeks, so I was kind of left with what I had here. But ideally, I want to have a, a constant communication with the concept artist and make sure that I'm being true to the concepts of the character, which is what I'm going to ask you to do. So something else I wanted to point out to you before I move on to another character, because uh, we're going to see this thematically in a lot of the other characters the student works, is that I have a set of rules for edge loops on the face. And these rules have been developed and refined over the years by looking at a lot of successful orcs in the industry. And for example, uh, this loop I have selected right here. This one's what I call the face loop. It's the loop that separates the front of the face from the back of the skull. Basically, it separates between the flexible parts and the inflexible parts. And then within the face, I have these loops that I'm specifically looking for, and we'll go over that in detail, but I wanted to highlight that for you in the face that there is actually uh, a strategy that I'm looking for and I can go through clicking and highlighting specific loops. And uh, this one here, I call, uh, I actually, I don't call this, I can't remember who first called this, but uh, this is called the J hook. It's just a little hook, upside down J, that hooks around the nose and it tends to come on the underside of the lip. Some people bring it underneath the chin. With this character, because I had such a flat face, uh, I, tended, I, I decided to bring this loop in front of the chin uh, in there. And then of course the multiple loops that define the lips. And then there's there's a loop here that I call the muzzle loop. And that one lives right there. So again, because our face was so flat, the muzzle loop ended up coming more towards the front of the nose. On, on other models, I'll bring the muzzle loop up across the bridge of the nose, just between where the bone of the nose ends and the cartilage begins. Uh, but in this particular character, I had to tuck it down, again, because of how compact the face was. Okay, so before I go on to uh, some student work, let's just go back in time one step at a time to see a couple of things that, that I have done and what I've learned over the years. So um, this piece was modeled uh, somewhere around 2008. And this is during an experimental course called 3D Human Head. This is self-portrait that I've completed. And it was based on photographs, several photographs from front, side, top, three-quarter views, um, mirrors, lots of time set, uh, uh, lots of time spent sitting in front of a mirror, and um, trying to come up with as realistic a depiction of myself as I could possibly do 
uh, with both uh, photographic reference and direct observation. All right, so here's where I really came to uh, understand face topology. So this, this whole course was about uh, the human head, so face topology was a big chunk of the semester. Um, notice a couple of unique properties about this face topology. For example, this loop right here. Uh, that one, which tends to shoot off towards the ear, this loop serves one particular purpose, really, and that is to give geometry in the cheek for plasticity of the cheek, but more importantly, for furrowing the brow. So this is going to be very useful in expressions. You'll see in earlier versions I'll use triangles in the brow. I don't recommend that. This U shape is much su superior to that. Uh, also notice that I have this clear J hook that I mentioned in the last character, which comes just slightly underneath the chin. And the muzzle loop, which again, like I said, comes across the the end of the bone to the beginning of cartilage, and that one goes under the chin. And then the face loop, which is going to be on the hairline. So the face loop is more than likely that one. That's going to be my hairline loop, and it might go back as far as this one. So I actually have two or three edges that I can use to define hairlines, but this one more than likely is the actual hairline. Okay, and then sev several ocular loops, many, many, depending on how realistic you want this to be, many edge loops. And it gets really tough when you're trying to go realistic like this, it's particularly around the eyes. I'll spend an enormous amount of time modeling the eyes. Uh, let's see, so on and so forth. I don't need to get into a lot of detail right now. We're going to save that for later. Uh, the ear. So just get a general sense of what's happening with the ear. Basically with the ear, my general policy is uh, make it look as much as you can like an ear and then transition off as much as you can on the back side of the ear. Like put all your garbage in the back. Like here I've got some six edge pole sitting back here. I've got several triangles transitioning things. I was trying to be more true to the form of the ear and less true to uh, topology. And there's it's high enough in, in topo it's high enough in poly count to support uh, and prevent texture stretching problems. And if I really was serious about this thing, this is actually the low poly version of it. I'll probably go in here and do a process of smoothing, and that's just going to pump the model way up. Actually, that was way too high, but uh, let me try that again. I don't want two levels. I just want one. There we go. So that's high poly. That will support good, clean deformation. But notice how hard it is to see where the edge loops are. So I highly recommend um, some other steps like creating edge sets or poly sets for selections before actually pumping up the geometry. Uh, this character, let's take a look at the face in this one. This is where I didn't have as clear an understanding of how the face deforms. So you can see I did some things in the brow and the nose that I would not do today. I have these triangles. I have triangles. I have triangles. I have triangles, triangles. I have probably n-gons floating somewhere. And I've improperly capped off the eye. That should actually be round in the back. Actually conform to the ball of the eye. Um, some things I still did the same here. Mm, oh, maybe I didn't. No, I didn't. I was going to say that was a J-hook, but that's not a J-hook. Okay, so I, I, I didn't do that the way I intend to do it. Uh, I do have a muzzle loop. Okay, I did that right. Um, I probably have a face loop. Yeah, that's the face loop. That's the hairline loop. But I've got this triangle stopping dead the loop right there because I was concerned about having too much geometry flowing from the ear over to the face. I really shouldn't have been concerned about that because I don't want these to be too rectangular. I want those to be more square. I mentioned that earlier. Oh, I've got this triangular shaped four point right here on the fleshy part of the cheek. That's a bad idea. Really, I should just let those three edges just flow underneath the chin. Just let them go. Don't try and stop it. Don't try to minimize it. 
more triangles here. I was really obsessed with low poly back then. I was trying to have like a high poly look, but still keep the poly count low. And I'm thinking just throw that crap out the window because it's always easier to reduce a model than it is to add to a model. So just pump it up, go high poly. And I have strategies on how to crawl your way up to high poly in Maya. And of course we can just start at millions of polygons in ZBrush. But um, in, in Maya, there is a strategy for crawling your way up to high poly without um, making it uh, an unreasonable task. There are some things that I did in the shoulders of this character that I still live with today that I think are just fantastic. Uh, well, not that one. That's not a good one. Uh, this is a good one. So it goes to the sternum, goes under the armpit, comes around, hooks around the scapula, comes down, and meets at the spine. And it makes for a very nice deformation shape. Whereas things like this one are just crap because it spirals around. We really want to avoid edge loops, poly loops that spiral. Uh, that's, that's a big problem. That's a big deal. I should really just let that one travel all the way over to the sternum. But for some reason, I was obsessed with getting it just, just so. And I probably just didn't want to put enough geometry in there to describe what needed to be described. So I'm going to skip to another object way back to 2002 to show up some problems with that one. Okay, so there's this guy. And this was one of my, I think this was probably my second or third character I've ever attempted to make back uh, at the beginning. Um, so this was very early on, and I stayed true to the concept. Let me pull up the concept for you. Oh, you know what? Before I go on to that concept, here's one of those uh, characters that I don't have access to the to the model currently, uh, but I had a couple renders of it. So this is that dog guy, and he was actually completely unwrapped at the time. Uh, again, at that time, I was still obsessed with low polygon, so I'm doing a, I'm I'm making a grand mistake with this character that I mentioned earlier about subdivision surfaces, where I'm relying on the subdivision surfaces to define the contours and wireframe uh, and topology of the character. So this is the concept on the left and the finished black and white render on the right with the textures on the troll character. So looking at this, you're thinking, that's really freaking cool. And I thought it was too. But this whole topic has really been about topology and how the topology benefits the other processes of 3D. So let me show you what you should never do. All right, so we'll take a close look at this guy. And I'll hit number one. That is the actual topology. I'll turn on the wireframe. This is the actual topology of this character. It is absolutely insane and it was a ton of fun to make it to just go crazy and not have any concern whatsoever actually at the time I, it's not that I didn't have any concern I actually just didn't have any knowledge about how dramatic an effect this was going to have on actually solving animation and deformation and texturing texturing this sucker was incredibly difficult I think I re-rigged and enveloped this guy ten times over um, I just made it so incredibly difficult for myself to create this. And there is actual animations of this guy walking at some point. I did it all in Lightwave back in the day. And I just wanted you to see a glimpse of a ridiculously insane wireframe that will break your back and probably demoralize you. So don't do this. <laughs> so let's just take a little bit of time and look at a, a two or three student works from spring 2012. Uh, this work was done by Evan Nance, and it was designed by Kayla San Filippo. And the wireframe on this is really quite excellent. Uh, let's just turn on the wireframe here. Um, what Evan did really well uh, on this piece is how the polygon flow density from high density and the face flows to relative uh, low density on the remaining part of the body was just a really good solution and a lot of those solutions are uh, hidden back here in the, in the head and how well he localized the amount of data between the ears and the eyes and the front of the face following a lot of the principles I laid down for building face loops. Uh, throughout the body, you can see a fairly even distribution of polygons. So the polygons are fairly square-like, except in certain areas where there's a bit of stretching, like on the deltoid or near the armpit. Uh, the hands look pretty good. 
in terms of density and modeling in the cloth was done fairly well and if we just hide this piece you can see uh, the minimal amount of work required for knees and such and if we take a look at one of the foot there's actual toes there and a heel and the heel of this foot isn't quite what I would expect at this time we'll see something different on the next student's work uh, in just a few minutes so pretty good work here uh, great accessorizing it and of course uh, posing the character modeling it into the pose uh, done almost exclusively, I think exclusively, in Maya. So there's no ZBrush involvement with this piece. Let's take a look at another one. Okay, this piece is done by Jonathan Cavacho, and we've seen an example of his work a couple of times now. Uh, this piece was originally modeled and started his model in ZBrush, so he did the whole concepting, uh, I'm sorry, not concepting, but um, sketching from concept in ZBrush. So he started with high detail first and then brought it to low. And then he did the retopologizing. I believe he did the, retop the retopo in Maya. Following uh, the edge loop rules laid down in the traditional method. There are a few things around the model that could be improved, such as the spacing on this edge loop here. Um, there could be split again. Um, certain long or rectangular-like uh, polygons could be split further. Um, basically, in general, I think this could be a higher poly mesh. Um, John was trying to target something that was in the mid-range or high-range poly count for video game. So that was his target audience at the time. So in that respect, he did well. Um, there is a star, a, a six-edge a star back here. Um, that would be a problem with shoulder deformations, possibly even the texture. Legs look good, and the heel looks good, uh, contrasting the heel to Evans. Um, this follows a practice that I now use um, for all uh, heels, whether it's an animal's foot or human's foot or humanoid's foot, um, where we don't extrude from the front face of the polygon, extruded pulling down. We just rotate the edge loop and continue the extrusion forward. It makes for a much more uh, envelopable, uh, de deformable heel is what I'm trying to say. It makes for a much easier to deform heel. Um, polygons are relatively evenly spaced out, uh, higher density on the shoulders in some areas, though I think there could be an extra split maybe here for deformations in the armpit uh, and maybe here as well in this area. Very nice, pretty good, accessorized well, and I believe there are digits underneath this glove. Nope, no digits. Okay, so he just, you know, chopped away and said, okay, I don't need those. I'm just going to do the gloves because the, the character was not going to take them off. And the boots are modeled in. Uh, the boots don't come off. Very good. Let's look at another one. Okay, this one is by Marcin Zeibel, and uh, he was a student visiting from Poland. He's now back home, uh, again from spring 2012. Uh, he... He buddied up with Jonathan Cavaccio in the classroom where they swapped concepts. So John made Marson's concept and Marson made John's concept. Uh, both concepts created from the character design course at ARC. Um, so let's take a look at the face, first of all. So at first glance, without selecting it, and with subdivision surfaces turned on, everything seems okay. Uh, after a closer look and turning off subdivision surfaces and turning on the wireframe, we could see that there actually would be many problems with particularly the neck and under the jaw. So there's a really high density coming around the muzzle, uh, far more than is actually needed to articulate the expression. And a lot of that geometry should have been allowed to cast underneath the jaw as opposed to circling around to the front of the face because the downside is that the jaw was stretched most likely because he decided to get it into pose to strike a pose uh, there's also a lot of geometry coming from the back of the ear down along with the neck which causes for a high density in this area with long skinny polygons and then broad open polygons here which may end up causing problems with the textures and definitely causes problems with deformation and then right here inside the ear uh, we've got these long sliver-like polygons that would uh, definitely 
cause problems with the texture so he wouldn't be able to do any detailed painting right there it just had to be a flat color um, other parts and pieces seem okay the accessories seem okay um, other areas of the body could use some serious work there are sections of the hand that are polygons are inverted so that has to be watched out for you can see that the they're backwards um, the wrist could have several divisions splitting across it there's no no need at all to be this simple that's just far too simple and the clothing seems to be really the best part of the model um, not to say that this isn't a good model or that he didn't keep to the design he kept very well to the design but this jacket the shirt jacket piece is probably the best designed piece on the whole thing and again because I see square like polygons that are evenly distributed um, it's very very easy for me to use the smooth tool I can come over here and hit smooth and increase the density and that would make a nice cloth deformation if I wanted to take it that far whereas uh, polygons that are not evenly distributed such as the neck density here and then you know very broad open on the cheek and then really really dense here and then really broad on the tip of the nose that's going to be a problem with textures and then really dense right here that does not make for for it to be very easily uh, smooth so if I smooth that I'm just going to get more of the same just a lot more polygons so it looks like the nose is better but it's just really really crowded in here and now it's just hard to manage Okay, so this is a glimpse at some success stories that have some work to do, but again, most of these folks were doing, uh, were creating characters for the very first time. So congratulations to them, and uh, thank you for being an example for the future generation.